Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Endometriosis Awareness, Empowering Patients. I'm Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research. SWHR is the thought leader in promoting research on sex as a biological variable and improving women's health through science, policy, and education. We are pleased today to have three distinguished panelists joining us. Dr. Stacy Mismer is a professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive biology at Michigan State University. Dr. Susie Asani is an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology and director of the University of Michigan Endometriosis Center. And Tara Hilton is a patient advocate and founder of the Yellow Cape, a Delaware-based endometriosis advocacy nonprofit. I'd also like to thank AbbVie for sponsoring today's webinar. We are live tweeting during today's event, so we invite you to use the hashtag SWHRTalksEndo as you tweet along. And at this time, I'd like to introduce SWHR's Director of Science Programs, Dr. Irina Ninye, who will be moderating the event today. Thank you, Katie, and welcome everyone. Endometriosis is a gynecological condition that affects more than 200 million women worldwide. It is a chronic condition in which the tissue that resembles the uterine lining grows outside of the uterus, forming lesions that may cause pain in your pelvis and back, between periods and with intercourse. There are also concerns with heavy menstrual bleeding and infertility. Endometriosis can severely impact a patient's quality of life. And due to societal stigma around menstruation and gynecological disorders, for many women, the disease often goes undiagnosed or untreated for some time. SWHR's Endometriosis and Uterine Fibroids Network was founded in 2018 to raise awareness of research gaps in unmet needs in endometriosis and fibroid care. The network consists of researchers, clinicians, patient advocates, and policy leaders who are passionate about improving care for those with endometriosis and fibroids. SWHR has worked with this network to address patient needs on their journey through diagnosis, treatment, and the management of endometriosis. So today we have three experts from our endo network here with us to share some information about endometriosis, as well as some insight and strategies for empowering patients and enhancing their quality of life while experiencing endometriosis. Following the speaker presentations, I'll be moderating a discussion with all of our panelists. So we invite you to use the Q&A box to submit questions throughout the event. So we are gonna kick off this conversation with Dr. Stacy Mesmer, who will share about the prevalence and impact of endometriosis, as well as how stigma adds to the burden of disease. Dr. Mesmer. Oh, thanks much, Irene. Let me share the proper screen. All right, here we go. So again, thank you very much, Irene, for that great introduction. Thank you to um, the Society of Women's Health Research for organizing our webinar today. And I'm going to start us off with talking about endometriosis scope and um, burden of disease for girls and women. So what is, actually, let me minimize that. All right. So what is endometriosis? Who does it affect? Well, as Irene already summarized a bit, endometriosis is defined by the finding of tissue resembling the lining of the uterus outgrowing and surviving outside of the uterus. So this tissue is often called lesions, sometimes referred to as plaques or implants, um, nodules for deep endometriosis, um, endometriomas, ovarian um, endometriotic cysts. And in addition to uh, that required presentation of the observation of these endometriotic lesions, there are symptoms common to uh, associated with endometriosis. So these include most prevalent is pelvic pain um, during menstruation, but also between periods, lower back pain, painful intercourse, often painful um, uh, defecation and urination, infertility, and fatigue. We see about 80% of those with endometriosis referring, uh, um, confirming that fatigue impacts their life. And so this has a, a large impact on the quality of life of girls and women with endometriosis. From the World Endometriosis Research Foundation conducted several years ago, a global study of women's health. This includes centers from across the world um, in eight countries and a total of 3,000 women 
reported um, who had had surgically confirmed endometriosis reported on their quality of life impacts. These included about half re per reported that endometriosis was impacting their sexual health and a full third reported impacts on relationship with family, performance at work and school, um, re impacts on their household, housekeeping and home um, life environment, attendance at, attendance at work and school and indifferent to um, their performance, social activities and also participation, about 20% participation at sports, particularly for um, adolescents and those in high school. And these uh, impacts ha happen at you know, critical points in the lives of, of girls and, and women, where for, particularly for adolescents, when they're just forming sort of who they are, how they want to move in the world, their social networks, their um, comfort with um, social uh, interactions, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the stigma of, of menstrual health and um, menstrual, menstruation related disorders and how that um, impacts life as well. So endometriosis effects across the lifespan. The estimates that we have are about 17% of adolescents who are menstruating overall 10% of women across the life course. That's how we get at that 200 million women who likely have endometriosis. That um, uh, when we look at world population levels of women with reproductive age, that 10% translates to that 200 million women and about 5% of patients who are postmenopausal. Now, the importance of these numbers though these are only our estimates among those who are successfully diagnosed. And so we have to consider a lot who, who ends up with a successful diagnosis, um, what the impacts of difficulty of diagnosis have on these numbers, and the reality that um, given the requirement for surgical or ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging, MRI um, uh, diagnoses, why this may not be a true reflection of endometriosis um, affecting girls and women across the globe. So one of the critical things on these paths to diagnosis is, first we have to note that there's a, a, an issue, that there, there are symptoms that are informative. And so we have this problem with what is normal menstruation. And normal really to any individual is what, um, uh, what is normal to them. These are often um, symptoms and circumstances that aren't highly discussed. We know that on average, um, periods occur every 21 to 35 days. They last from two to seven days. And they can vary a lot in terms of the volume of menstrual flow from light to moderate, which again is, is difficult to, to discuss sort of how those are perceived. The critical thing is that um, nor what is not normal is when menstruation is having a significant disruption on, on the, the lives of girls and women. That not normal is um, life impacting symptoms. So it is normal to have some bloating, some cr menstrual cramping, potentially food cravings, mood changes, sleep problems associated with menstruation. But when those symptoms are altering the ability to um, to move through the world in the way that they wish, that is when it becomes a critical issue. That's also where our silence about menstrual health becomes problematic. So in terms of menstrual stigma, um, there's some really emerging wonderful literature from reports around, um, for example, about a fifth of women report that they don't feel comfortable talking about menstruation with a healthcare provider and about 60% of women have felt embarrassment when they're having their period, embarrassed about um, menstruating. That's a huge proportion. We also um, have evidence that about two thirds of teens believe that society teaches people to be ashamed of their periods. So clearly we are doing something very wrong in, in this, this context. And we want you to think about the lens of that context in terms of what that means when you're struggling with menstrually and gynecologically related conditions. Also 10% of men report that they don't feel comfortable talking about menstruation ever to anyone. So these, these levels of stigma really impact 
um, what we know about endometriosis, what we know about prevalence, and directly impact diagnosis. So we know that three out of four people um, experience a misdiagnosis before getting an accurate diagnosis of endometriosis. We know that three or more physicians on average are visited with a complaints of these endometriosis associated symptoms before there is a successful diagnosis. And that translates into an average of seven years from onset of symptoms to a formal diagnosis. So these are all um, issues that we want to bring into the context of discussion for this webinar and want you to be keeping in mind as we move forward with our next excellent presenters. So thank you and I will throw back to Irene. Thank you, Dr. Mismer, for conveying the impact of endometriosis on patients. I'd like to now invite Dr. Susie Asani to speak about the diagnosis, current and emerging treatment options, and factors to consider while planning a treatment. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Asani. Great. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure to be here, and thank you to the Society for Women's Health Research for their advocacy and their really incredible work that's um, moved the needle in our ability to better care for as well as research um, on patients uh, to, to improve the overall quality of life. Um, can you see the correct screen? Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna talk about endometriosis, uh, medical diagnosis, I'm sorry, surgical diagnosis as well as management. So one of the most important questions as a patient, as a clinician, is how is endometriosis diagnosed? Well, as Dr. Mismer mentioned, um, endometriosis is defined as a histopathological diagnosis. That means we actually need to have tissue to look under a microscope to confirm the diagnosis. And so in order to obtain that, the gold standard method of diagnosing endometriosis is a laparoscopy in which we uh, perform a surgical procedure by placing a very small camera into the abdominal uh, cavity, looking at the organs, and then collecting a tissue sample for evaluation. Um, and patients on at the time of surgery can have a wide range of severity of endometriosis. It could be a couple uh, small spots in uh, various areas in the pelvis, or it can be quite extensive, um, deeply infiltrating and um, involving um, deep tissues within the ovaries or behind the uterus um, or even the bowel, um, bladder and other locations. Um, but the critical thing that I really want to point out is, is that while laparoscopy is considered the gold standard diagnosis, we really need to have a very high level of suspicion based on patient symptoms, based on a patient physical exam, as well as uh, imaging that might suggest endometriosis. And we know that um, pelvic ultrasound can be very helpful in the diagnosis of endometriotic cysts or chocolate cysts that involve the ovaries. And pelvic MRI can also be quite helpful in diagnosing deeply infiltrative endometriosis um, uh, that uh, involves the bowel or um, the areas in the ovary or behind the uterus or uh, bladder, for example. And so we, we really should not be necessarily waiting until surgery to make the diagnosis, but we should have a high clinical uh, suspicion for endometriosis simply based on a patient's history, uh, physical exam, and potentially preoperative imaging. The other important thing to recognize is that endometriosis, while the most common symptoms of endometriosis are the triad of pain symptoms, so it's painful periods, it's non-menstrual pelvic pain, as well as painful intercourse, there are many other conditions that can actually cause chronic pelvic pain as well as abdominal pain. So within reproductive organs, the types of conditions that we see and treat as gynecologists would include endometriosis, but conditions like adenomyosis, primary dysmenorrhea, uterine fibroids, pelvic congestion, for example, can actually cause all of the very similar symptoms that we see in patients with endometriosis. And we also need to be aware that there are many other conditions in the pelvis, both urologic conditions, as well as gastrointestinal conditions, as well as musculoskeletal and uh, peripheral nerve conditions that can actually also cause overlapping conditions. So things like painful bladder syndrome or interstitial cystitis, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, pelvic floor myofascial pain 
um, can cause very uh, similar symptoms such as pelvic pain, bowel dysfunction, as well as urinary dysfunction. And we actually also know that even if you have endometriosis, you're actually more likely to develop these other conditions. So it's incredibly important to be aware of the overlapping symptoms with other chronic pain conditions, and then to really have an uh, excellent team of physicians that can treat every potential etiology of pain. So when getting back to endometriosis, whether the um, endometriosis was diagnosed clinically and or surgically, we basically have two prongs to our treatment for endometriosis. So in terms of medical options, so we're not reviewing surgeries here on this slide, um, our general options are to, uh, to do some combination of treatments that suppress the actual endometriosis lesions hormonally, and a strategy to treat the pain. So with regards to suppressing the endometriosis lesions, we know that uh, endometriosis is an estrogen sensitive condition and that doing something to generally lower the levels of estrogen have uh, consistently been demonstrated to uh, uh, be associated with improvement in patients' clinical symptoms. And this can be done in a variety of different ways. So these can be done with a combination hormonal contraceptive pill that contains both estrogen and progestin, so a classic uh, birth control pill. We do this often with progestin-only therapies, and several of these have been specifically FDA approved for the treatment of endometriosis. And we can also do these with GRNH analogs, so gonadotropin-releasing analogs, either agonists or antagonists, um, to uh, lower estro estrogen levels. Uh, Danazol is also approved uh, for the treatment of endometriosis, and it's method is uh, slightly different than these uh, other options here. But in general, most of these options are equivalent. There aren't a lot of studies that compare each option to each other, but we generally know that for the vast majority of uh, these uh, treatment options, about 70 to 80% of patients report a significant improvement in their symptoms. And so how you select them sort of depends on what you've tried before, what are the side effects, what are the goals, and working with your physician. Um, but we also know that there are many other treatment strategies to treat pain, um, and it's important to have a multimodal approach to treating uh, chronic pain. So non-prescription pain relief options are very important in the management of painful menstrual periods as well as pelvic pain, and these include things like ibuprofen or other types of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. But we actually know that things like regular exercise, yoga, rest, relaxation, meditation, actually have been clinically proven in randomized controlled trials to uh, be beneficial for the treatment of painful periods as well as non-menstrual pain. Um, in some patients with more complex pain conditions, we do sometimes prescribe uh, uh, other methods of pain relief, so things like muscle relaxants. And we do actually know that there are a variety of uh, medications that are traditionally in the class of antidepressants or anticonvulsants that can actually be used to lower pain thresholds and to manage pain uh, without necessarily a patient having uh, conditions like depression or uh, seizures. So these are also uh, potentially very important strategies. Surgical treatment is absolutely um, indicated in many patients that have endometriosis. It is not necessarily indicated in every patient. Um, and the decision to proceed with surgery really depends on the specific situation for a patient, her specific fertility goals at the time of the procedure, as well as her long-term goals. Certainly our overall goal for any given patient is, is that she has one effective surgery and really to try to avoid multiple repetitive surgeries over time. And so there are um, specific uh, situations in, one, uh, in which surgery is considered um, the best route of treatment. These include situations like when a patient has tried medical therapy and that hasn't been helpful, when a patient isn't a candidate for medical therapy, such as an example of when she's actively trying to become pregnant and has significant pain. If a patient has a large uh, enlarging adnexal mass, so a lar an enlarging ovarian uh, cyst that is suspicious for endometriosis, um, that is an indication for surgery. And certainly patients that have deeply infiltrative disease that is causing obstructive symptoms of the bladder or urinary tract, those patients are not likely to respond to medical treatment and should proceed with surgery. So as a patient um, and as a provider, when you're thinking about surgery, I think there are a lot of really important questions that a patient should ask their provider. The first and most important is, is what type of surgery do you recommend? 
Are you, are we talking about um, excisional surgery to remove the endometriosis lesions, um, but preserve the ovaries and or uterus? Or are we talking about hysterectomy? Are you going to do it in a minimally invasive fashion through laparoscopy, or does this surgery uh, require an open technique? Um, how long will the surgery last? And what is your expectation for me with regards to my recovery? And what are the types of complications that I might have to anticipate? There is certainly no risk-free surgery. There's no risk-free treatment. Um, and what would be the most common as well as uh, less common, but uh, more morbid or more uh, severe types of complications that I could experience? Um, and then another really important line of questions is, is that we know that surgery is not curative for every patient. And we know that no matter what treatment we pursue, any patient can have recurrence of symptoms. And those recurrence of symptoms sometimes indicate recurrence of endometriosis. So it's important to talk with your physician about, well, what will happen if my pain does not improve after surgery? Or what will happen if my pain initially improves, but then it comes back down the road? How do we address that? Um, is there anything that you would recommend for me to do um, to prevent recurrence um, of pain after surgery? Or are there other things that you think might potentially be causing my pain that we should be treating before and after surgery? And then finally, for patients who want to preserve the option of getting pregnant in the future, how will surgery affect my future chance of becoming pregnant? Because there are certainly some types of surgical procedures that can actually decrease and or um, uh, negatively impact future fertility. So when you decide a treatment plan, this really should be a process of shared decision-making with the patient, with her family support, as well as the provider. And there are many different factors that will affect a treatment plan. Um, your age, your lifestyle, your family planning goals, the treatments that you've tried before, what has worked and wasn't, what hasn't worked, um, what types of uh, management uh, options you've tried, as well as how helpful they've been, and have there been any side effects of those treatments. Um, these are all important considerations, and I think it's in, really important to also recognize that all of these can change over time. And so whether um, it's a younger woman, um, you know, before she's um, uh, had her family um, that wants to preserve her fertility and potentially wants to avoid surgery, what are the medical options? And these priorities can certainly change over time for any given uh, patient uh, over her lifetime. And so what might work for her on a given day might not be the right set of treatment options for her five to 10 years later. And then finally, this um, slide is really just to, meant to emphasize to both providers as well as patients, um, a shared decision uh, strategy with the provider and patient is really critical to making sure that every patient is heard, her priorities are heard, and that you make a shared decision uh, based on those priorities. But it's not just a one-stop um, deal. You know, we always need to reassess. Um, once we try a treatment, not every treatment works. We reassess in a couple months after that treatment and then readjust the plan according to her response and her priorities at the time. So um, that is uh, my summary. It is really a pleasure to, again, be here. And I'll turn it back over to Irene for uh, Ms. Hilton, our next um, speaker. Thank you, Susie. And now I'd like to invite um, Tara Hilton to share her own endometriosis story and give her insight on discussing endo with providers as well as wellness tips for better day-to-day -day living with endometriosis. Thank you, Irene. Um, so again, I'm Tara Hilton, the founder of The Yellow Cape. And I just wanna thank the Society of Women's Health Research again for the incredible work you're doing and for giving us this opportunity. I'm very honored to be here and to be able to share the patient journey aspect. So uh, like so many others, the patient journey is just full of so many lessons learned and potholes. And I think that we've gotten to a much better place, but back when I started my journey, I had so many lessons learned. So trying to put them on this slide, I decided to hit some of the big milestones. 1990 is the earliest time I can remember of when I really, really started feeling symptoms. And it was to a point to where I went to high school every single month, I would notice I was in the nurse's office. I had incredible pain to where I couldn't function like the other kids. And 
you know, I had an incredible amount of bleeding that was just so embarrassing, bleeding through my clothes. And I just sort of didn't feel like mine, you know, my uh, period was the same as the other girls my age. The school nurse said the most incredible sentence that we all cringe at, and it's, it's just a bad period. So I heard those words. I thought, okay, Tara, you're a wimp, you're weak. You got to just deal with this. And I used to be so jealous of the others my age and wanted to be strong like them. So, uh, you know, throughout high school, yeah, I became a, um, you know, someone that was a frequent visitor to the nurse's office. I would go in there the first day, second day sometimes of my cycle, lay in there with a heating pad all day. She was constantly giving me ibuprofen, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Tylenol. Um, and it just, you know, was something I, I accepted as my normal. Um, fast forward to 1995, you know, I went back, saw a new family doctor and she said, you know, you have irritable bowel syndrome. That's what's wrong with you. And I was like, wow, finally, I have a diagnosis. Only the medicine she gave me didn't change anything. It continued on. Um, you know, all my symptoms were still there. Uh, I became a young mother. And so I had two children. And I noticed that both pregnancies, as far as pain wise, you know, that I had been experiencing with my cycle was gone for the nine months. And then after I gave birth, it came back with a vengeance. So I continued through my journey, you know, like this is irritable bowel syndrome. I've just, you know, it's a bad period. I have irritable bowel syndrome, toughen up, you gotta make it. You'll see in 2006 on here, I finally, finally saw a gynecologist. I was recently married, you know, and decided I'm gonna, um, you know, try to have a child. We took out an IUD, which was one of the prior treatments for some of my pain. Um, and three weeks later, I was still just bleeding profusely. I was in incredible amount of pain. And after a um, pelvic ultrasound, they determined I had, I think it was six, six centimeter um, chocolate cyst on one of the ovaries and some other things going on. And they wanted to take me into surgery pretty quickly. So go in for a minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery to remove a cyst. Um, you know, at the time, like I said, I was just married. So my husband had driven or flown into town and we just went into surgery. I lived in a different state from my family. Um, so I thought, you know, I'll wake up in a couple hours, I'll feel a lot better. When I woke up, I was in ICU and a couple of my family members from a nearby state were next to my bed and I could tell everyone was crying. I was so confused, didn't understand what was going on. And when the doctor came in, we were told that as soon as she went in, she saw I was full of cancer, closed me up and told him it was spread everywhere and I probably didn't have very much longer to live. So I you know, spent a few days in the hospital trying to grasp that you know, I have two small children and now I'm going to die of some cancer I had no idea that I had. Um, decided to get a second opinion with a reproductive oncologist. So two weeks later I had my appointment and found out it wasn't cancer, it was endometriosis. The gynecologist wasn't familiar with severe endo, had severe stage four and frozen pelvis, and she saw the adhesions and thought it was cancer. So can you imagine, I spent two weeks thinking I was dying, but I felt better that I wasn't, I didn't have cancer, but then I felt just as um, confused that it was endometriosis. I didn't know much about it. Um, I want to point out between 1990 and 2006, you'll notice there's 16 years there between before I finally received a uh, correct diagnosis. That time's short now, but during that time, you don't see as multiple doctor appointments, multiple ER visits, multiple specialist visits, um, even being told that it was psychological and probably something I was experiencing from early childhood uh, molestation. So, you know, I spent a lot of time at counselor's offices trying to get rid of pain that was not actually in my head. Um, in between 2006 and 2014, which is my next big milestone, I spent a lot of time just feeling alone, feeling sad, missing out on a lot of life events. I, I became scared. I'm an extreme extrovert, but I would not accept plans with friends because I never knew if that day would be a bad day. And I didn't want to disappoint them. As was mentioned in a previous slide, it affects school, it affects your activities, it affects your social life. And I lost a lot of friendships because people thought I were I was just bailing out on them. Um, so one one particular morning, 
I was on Pinterest and I decided I can't find resources. So I'm going to start collecting what I can find and making them. Pinterest, I think, had been around maybe for four years at the time. Um, but I started an endometriosis board and I was pinning something like I do when I wake up early, can't sleep with the pain, trying to distract myself. And I noticed that there was a doctor that liked my endo board. I was like, who the heck is this? And it was um, Dr. Najat. Uh, you know, well-known in the endo community, makes some of the endometriosis surgical tools and things like that. And that's when um, he reached out and his team reached out and they were starting what was called the Worldwide Endo March. So I was one of the very early people that were recruited to be in that representing the state. And from there, it was just, it was just a great outlet for me to really take some of this adversity that came with the disease and turn it into something good. So at that, that point, I had been hiding this battle in, in private, hadn't talked about it, didn't tell people about it, but I knew if I were going to go down to D.C. and speak in front of the world, I needed to just, you know, finally start coming out and stop being embarrassed about it. And that was very liberating for me. Um, so again, like fast forward to 2016, where you see it, I had, had been through so many surgeries, 11 surgeries. Um, you know, failed in vitro. Um, I had come to a point to where my endometriosis was so tightly bound and I'd had enough cleanup surgeries where it was getting dangerous to keep going in there. I decided I kept getting bowel blockages and I finally had to make a decision to, um, you know, start a new chapter. I um, ended the chapter of, you know, hopeful having another child in life and decided I needed to be proactive because it had become um, to a point where, you know, uh, an emergency surgery was not gonna leave me in a good position. So I needed to be proactive about this. And that's when I decided to have a major cleanup surgery, full hysterectomy, um, and they did quite a bit of work. But this, this is a pretty extreme case, but a lot of these similarities are exactly that for the people that go through endo. In there, what I didn't mention is, you know, it's confusing because you have to take the treatment that is available to you with the type of insurance you have. And oftentimes that can limit us. So do the best you know, that you can with what you have. Um, try not to get weighed down when people are like, take this medicine. No, don't take that medicine. That's the wrong surgery. This is the right surgery. That's the wrong kind of doctor. It, it just becomes overwhelming. Just take a step back, look at your own scenario and you have to make the decisions with your doctor that fit with everything that you have. One of the biggest, biggest challenges in my journey was fighting the stigma. As I mentioned early on, the nurse had me convinced that I was weak, I was wimpy. Um, I you know, couldn't handle things as strong as my peers. And so we have this stigma around always comparing yourself to someone else's journey, someone else's cycle, someone else in some kind of way. You know, some people are just fine and make it through and other people, you know, it really, really impacts them. So try your best not to compare yourself. Compare yourself to yourself if you have to. Keep a journal, you know, and look at any changes that you have for yourself, but just don't, don't compare yourself to other people. Um, when people make some of these stigma comments like Shark Week, Monthly Visitor, Ant Flow, the curse on the rag, you know, the time of the month, it makes us feel embarrassed and like it's something we shouldn't talk about. But if you feel like something's wrong, talk about it. Talk to your doctor, talk to friends or support that you trust, you know, and, and just don't be afraid. I think if I had known that and someone gave that advice to me early on, I would have talked about this sooner and not um, accepted a, a silent life sentence that I did for many years. Jumping ahead, so again, like talking with your provider, you know, talk to them about how, how do I know if what I'm experiencing is endometriosis? Don't let them write it off. You know, if you really strongly feel it's not IBS or some of these other things maybe that you started with, just ask them point blank. Like, do you think what I'm experiencing is endometriosis? Um, don't be afraid to sit back and wait for them to talk to you about a, a laparoscopic surgery. I did that and I've probably could have saved myself, you know, five or six years. I'm not saying, you know, the doctors obviously are the experts. So I'm not saying demand it, but just be open and say, you know, hey, should I get this to fully diagnose what's going on? Um, what do you suggest? 
talk to them about what treatments are there. If you, you know, feel like you've tried something and that doctor's going down that path, let them know I've tried this, didn't have great results. Is there something else I can try? Um, and be sure to ask them like, what are some of the risks and benefits? What are the side effects I should expect? Um, and, you know, obviously the surgical options are there. So when you're talking to them about whether or not you should get it, ask them what kind of surgery options do you have? Is there a skilled surgeon maybe, you know, in an invasive, non-invasive, minimally invasive procedure um, that they can refer you to if it's not in their expertise? Or if there's someone that has, you know, more knowledge that they feel comfortable referring you to, you know, don't be afraid to ask the very professional questions that I think sometimes we're afraid to do because we think our physicians may think that we're questioning them. Um, have an open dialogue with them. But also, you know, ask them too, like, are there any additional resources so that you can learn about the disease or any other similar diseases? Um, that's something I didn't know to ask and spent a lot of time on my own trying to find those resources. And I think now with all the awareness that we've brought to this disease, a lot of doctors know about different nonprofits and different, um, you know, resources out there that can help you so you don't, don't fight this alone. Um, the next step that I would say is like, once you've talked about that with your doctor and you have a plan, here are some wellness tips that will help you through your journey. Make sure number one, that you rest and relax when you need to. I always try to be a superhero. I didn't want people to say, oh, her disease hinders her, especially in the career world. Take that rest and relaxation when you need it. Don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid you know, to decline any plans that you have. When you travel, be prepared. What are some of those essential items that we all know? Let's say, number one, you know you need a heating pad. Have that ready. I used to travel for a living before the current role I'm in for seven years. I knew I had a list of things I needed in case I had an endometriosis flare while I was gone. Heating pad, do you need your ibuprofen and Tylenol? You know, are there things like with the painful urination, maybe you keep azo or something with you not throwing out medicine names, but just whatever it is that comforts you, have those ready and make sure you don't find yourself in a bad situation. Exercise and sports. Sometimes this is touchy because it's hard for us when you're having pain or you have so much fatigue to try to get up and do it. But on the days that you're feeling good or if you're a morning person or evening person, find that exercise or activity that, that you are able to do and that makes you feel good. It's so important. And then listen to your body. If you feel like you've maxed out after 20 minutes, that's okay. At least you did something. Don't overdo it because you'll pay the price. We, we, all, we are all familiar with that. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I so much was embarrassed of this and then also didn't want to burden my circle that a lot of times I kept it to myself. I, I'm fortunate that I never went through depression, but I know a lot of people do. Um, and I did always feel like that alone feeling, you know, I didn't have anyone to talk to and it's a lonely place to feel so alone, feel so different. Reach out there. There's fabulous Facebook support groups. Your doctor's office may even have support groups. The Yellow Cape, that's one of our biggest missions. We don't want anyone to ever feel like they have to battle this alone. So reach out. And if you don't feel like you have the support in your circle, that's another reason. Just make sure you have it. Mental health piece of this is an area that we don't talk about enough and it's important. Sexual health, we talk about it. It's just as uncomfortable, if not more than talking about your period. But guess what? We talk about it in our groups. How many times do we feel disappointment that we're giving our you know, um, spouses or our partners because we're not able to be you know, sexually healthy as we'd like to be? Talk about the pain, talk about every aspect of it and find a compromise. It's important. Um, snack well, you know, your diet, obviously there's a lot of inflammatory foods. So really do some research there and make sure that you're aware of the different foods that are causing maybe your symptoms to flare up. Uh, keep a journal, you know, and, and every aspect like that. But it's important. There's a lot of research around the diet um, piece of, of the flare-ups and the disease. And then work and school. Don't be afraid to ask for an accommodation. The example I'll give you before, you know, we um, pause is I, I was working at a bank and I would go early morning to get treatments with a medicine that would, you know, in, in my abdomen. 
Um, and you know, after the bandage up, I'd go to work and getting there an hour late would leave me on the 12th floor of a parking garage in, in the inner city. And nine times out of 10, the elevator was out. That may sound really lazy, but right after you've gotten that in your stomach, you're already fatigued. Oftentimes by the time I would get down, my bandage was bleeding through my clothes. It was embarrassing. And after a while I said, you know what, let me just ask if there's an accommodation. And I said, is there any way just for the days I'm getting treatment that I could have a close parking spot? And they came back and said, we want you to have one all the time. You're, you're battling a chronic illness. And they gave me a, a parking spot, no questions asked. My manager didn't have to know. And I never thought in a thousand years to ask for that accommodation. So, you know, by no means did I try to take advantage of it. And if I didn't need it, I didn't park there. And that way maybe someone else could have it. But when I did need it, I put myself first and said, this is one, you know, challenge I can take off my plate battling this disease. So I'm going to use it. Anyway, uh, again, thank you so much for having us. You know, we're here for support. If you need anything, reach out. I saw a question earlier real quick, Irene, that I just want to address that our support group also recognizes that there's a lot of um, folks in the LGBTQ plus community. There's a lot of non-binary, there's a lot of transgender that oftentimes are even more isolated because they may present as a man and finding it uncomfortable. We welcome you, we're here to support you. We have great relationships with doctors or can help you get past that barrier. So don't be afraid to reach out. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Tara, very much for you know, sharing your story, providing that insight. Thank you, um, Stacy and Susie as well uh, for setting the stage for the Q&A portion of this webinar. And as you mentioned, I see some questions have been coming in. Again, we invite uh, participants to use the Q&A box to ask questions. I see even in the chat, some have been sent along. We'll try to address as many individual questions and common themes as we can during this portion, uh, but we may not be able to get to them all. Um, let's start with, um, I know you addressed the, um, the one question. Um, what do you perceive, maybe Stacy or Susie, what do you perceive to be the most common indications that someone might have endo and not know it? Like how do they, what should trigger them to say, I need to ask more questions? Susie, you want to jump in for this one first? Yeah, well, I, you, you tricked me a little bit with saying and not know it. Um, I, I think that, you know, certainly we know that the most common symptoms of endometriosis are painful periods, non-menstrual pelvic pain, and uh, painful sex. Um, not every patient has all of them. We know about 70 to 80% of women have at least one of those symptoms. Um, I, I don't know that we really understand sort of what, who are the patients that are less likely to be aware and are diagnosed. I think that's probably more related to stigma, to lack of access to medical care, to lack of awareness. And that stigma can be both on an individual patient or person level, you know, that they feel shy and or, you know, not comfortable talking about it, but also it can come from social, you know, their family, their, their physicians and the responses that they've received. Thanks, Stacey, did you want to? Well, I, I would, would just add that and this is one of the things that's tricky in terms of um, access to diagnosis within families, for example. So, you know, you can have kind of two polar ends of reactions within a family. You can have a family who has dealt with, with pelvic pain and, and recognizes it as something that is not normal and something that should be brought to the attention of a, a clinician and should be fought for for um, attention and diagnoses and treatments. But on the other end, you can have families where these symptoms are common and the familial response is, this is, this, this is our normal. This is just what it's like to be um, uh, a, you know, someone who's menstruating. So um, uh, it, the, the, the perception of symptoms and our kind of lack of knowledge about um, what the real prevalence is and how that um, uh, uh, affects what we understand as being associated with the disease is, is complicated. And actually to kind of a follow up, there are a couple questions have come in because we mentioned, of course, there's endometriosis can be experienced throughout the lifespan. And, you know, 
it's been raised or asked about, you know, postmenopausal. And then that's something that often surprises individuals that if you don't have the estrogen levels um, in the earlier stages of life, how can you still experience endometriosis? But then there's also um, a question that asks about this, someone who has a full hysterectomy um, now almost, I guess, 20 plus years and is still endom experiencing endometriosis. So if you don't have a circulating estrogen, if you don't have your uterus ovaries, like how is that, you know, can you kind of speak to that? Yeah, so, I, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry, Susie. So I was- No, go, go. And, and Susie can definitely then then add, um, additionally, I just wanted to say that that from the, the, the scientific and the prevalence standpoint, um, historically, right up through now, almost all studies just focus on um, those who are premenopausal. And so we have very little data uh, among postmenopausal women. We know for certain that endometriosis can be diagnosed for the first time in postmenopausal women. What we don't know is if that's endometriosis that has been present and just now is delayed diagnosis, or if there is de novo development of, for example, endometrioma. So um, as people have more access to um, imaging as um, uh, scans for, for example, ovarian cancer concerns and things come up, we are definitely picking up now on more postmenopausal endometriosis than we had in the past. Um, the, the case series in the literature have almost solely been, women, been in women who are taking um, hormones in postmenopause, but we are seeing some cases among those who are not um, on hormones. So the short answer is we don't really know. And it's definitely an area that, that needs more attention. Clinically, Susie, um, sort of what is, what is your experience and knowledge around this been? Yeah, no, I mean, that you summarized it perfectly, um, Stacey, in that, you know, we know that endometriosis is an estrogen driven um, condition and um, it is quite rare in menopause, but it is not impossible. Um, some of the most common sort of case reports have been reported in women on hormone replacement therapy, so that they're actually getting estrogen as part of their hormone replacement therapy and then have uh, endometriosis, and many of them have had a history of endo. But exactly as Stacy has said, there are reports of patients not getting um, at least supplemental um, estrogen. Um, we do know that even in menopause, there is a possibility of low levels of estrogen. Estrogen comes not just from the ovaries, but it can come from adipose tissue or fatty tissue. And we also know that endometriosis lesions within themselves can um, generate estrogen. And so there are a lot of theories as to why this can happen. Um, so it is not common, but it is not impossible. Um, and newly diagnosed endometriosis in menopause does certainly raise the level of concern that there is a malignancy um, or malignancy within that lesion that you're seeing, whether it's an ovarian mass um, or, or um, uh, something like that. But it's, um, again, these are quite rare and um, certainly not the most common thing that would explain pelvic pain in menopausal women. What I think a related question that someone brought up was is, and I think it's sort of relevant to this, but to all patients in general is, is um, uh, someone asked in the chat is um, whether if someone has an ultrasound and we don't see endometriosis, does that exclude the possibility? I think it's really important to emphasize that the only way to um, almost certainly diagnose or exclude the possibility of endometriosis is generally by surgery. Um, ultrasound really, um, at least within the United States, um, really it does a very good job of diagnosing ovarian endometriosis, but generally a very poor job of diagnosing any other type of endometriosis. So endometri like uh, superficial as well as deep disease. Um, and so the absence of imaging findings on any type of imaging, whether it's ultrasound or MRI does not exclude the possibility. Um, it just um, uh, reduces the likelihood of a big ovarian lesion and or deep endometriosis, which we mostly see on MRI, but even uh, it's not 100% accurate. So it really um, doesn't exclude that possibility. I think part of the key take home message is if regardless of what age you are, regardless of what gender you are, if, if you're experiencing symptoms that don't feel right in your body, that deserves attention. And um, regardless of of age, this it is possible. 
that it's endometriosis with, you know, kind of varying commonalities across, across the life course. But the, the key thing is that, you know, the, to, to, to listen to when something seems wrong and discuss that with your clinician. Um, we have a question as far as when it comes to pain, I know you kind of touched on it, but um, when you have severe pain or um, pain during intercourse, what are, how do you alleviate that? And so, you know, is that what the birth control is for? Someone is asking or other treatments that are particularly helpful for that? Um, well, I, I would, this is a hard question to answer in a very short amount of time, but I, you know, I would say pain is a multifactorial symptom. And I think the most important thing um, to uh, be evaluated for with your physician and or medical team is what are all of the potential etiologies of pain and then develop a treatment strategy for each of the potential etiologies. So hormonal suppression and or surgery, you know, is directed specifically at the endometriosis lesions um, with hormonal suppression, suppressing the lesions and surgery excising them. Um, but that is not the only potential source of pain in women with endometriosis. And so the other types of things that we do, whether it's, um, uh, you know, medications and or physical therapy and or treating the other potential causes of pain in a patient with endometriosis like painful bladder or uh, irritable bowel syndrome is all directed at um, treating the underlying source of pain. Um, so it is multifactorial and multimodal, just depending on what the, the potential contributors are in a given patient. And every patient is different. So, you know, I see 10 patients in a given day, I might come up with four or five different treatment plans, depending on, you know, what are the potential sources in that given patient and what are our goals. And I, I think that is a great tie-in to, you know, something that you've all alluded to throughout um, your presentations and through the Q&A about it being a very individualized experience. And, you know, as you mentioned, pain coming in, um, it stems from various elements of what's going on in your body. So looking at the treatment plan will take into consideration the symptoms and the actual disease progression as well. And so um, it isn't an easy fix, but it's definitely one that it's a journey that you have to explore with your, with your healthcare provider. Um, the, there was a question that came up that I wanted to kind of, um, someone asked, what do you think are some of the next big questions that research should be answering concerning endometriosis? Well, I'll jump in. So, like so I, I, I think that's a great choice next, Irene, because it fits perfectly with the, the conversation we're already having, which is the, one of the, the big key questions is, um, what does the diversity of symptoms of present how endometriosis presents the diversity of what the treatment response is and the prognosis is very varied and so there there has to be um, some uh, explanatory underlying physiology that defines those differences there also has to be the ability to therefore get to um, uh, informative subtyping so for many, many diseases, um, cancer is, is often what people think of first and foremost, but, but this is true for autoimmune diseases. This is true for different pain disorders. This is true for um, a whole spectrum of diseases. There's more than 400 disease classification systems that are readily used in clinical care, whether it's for diagnosis or for treatment selection or for prognosis. Endometriosis is so obviously diverse that we must be able to get there. So, and I, I see that there's quite a few um, people in the panelist group who are, you know, leading bench scientists and, and leading um, clinical investigation people that um, that's one of the key places we're going next, that one size has never fit all and won't, won't fit all. And we need to, uh, to answer why, and that why will help us to get to better diagnostics, better treatments and better um, options for those with endometriosis. I wanted to take some time. Thank you so much. And before we wrap up, um, one last question 
um, that each of you can kind of answer with respect to your, your areas. What one thing would you recommend um, based off of your expertise or your experience that could help improve care for individuals with endo? So is it either what you think a clinician can do or even Tara, maybe when you answer, what can someone do to support? Um, that question came up, how can they support um, a partner or family member with endo? Do you want me to go because first? I can go right. start. So, um, sure, let's yeah. start with Susie. We'll start with Susie. We'll okay. end with you, Tara. Absolutely. All right. Well, I mean, I, I would say I probably just echo what Stacy just said in terms of our most important research um, agenda is that every person is different. Every patient is different. And um, endometriosis probably represents a very broad continuum of disease and probably multiple different diseases. And unfortunately, currently our treatment strategies are, you know, throw the kitchen sink at somebody and or just try one thing. And if that doesn't fail, move on to another. And we really need to be able to get to a more efficient, personalized approach based on the underlying specific mechanism um, of symptoms in a specific patient and then based on her or his um, priorities. Um, and so developing that personalized approach based on specific mechanisms, I would say, is, is our most um, important next goal, at least as a clinician. Thank you. Um, maybe Tara, if you want to go next, and then we'll end with Susie. I mean, Stacy. sorry. Mm -hmm. No problem. Um, from a support perspective, if you're supporting someone um, with endo, I would say just do as much as you can to make sure you understand. So educate yourself on the disease so that you're not um, adding some of these stigmas, you know, just get up, you'll feel better, things like that. Just try to be as understanding and flexible as, as possible. I always suggest going to a couple of the doctor appointments with them. I know it might be tough right now with COVID, but in a normal world, go with them because sometimes when they hear or you hear things straight from the doctor, uh, I think it makes you understand it a little bit better. But then also maybe find some of these support groups out there and just um, doing those type of things makes them feel like they're not alone. Uh, even, you know, massaging them or like, what can I do to help you? Maybe I'll take the kids and run downstairs so you can rest. Um, and I know that's easier said than done, but as much as you can to just really show your understanding and support and make them feel like they're not alone, I think is the number one thing I could suggest from that aspect. And Stacy, with um, your experience in the clinic and the research, what would you say? Um, I, you know, I, 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 I honestly, I come back to the key is that um, we have so many more fundamental questions than answers. And so um, now as we embrace technologies that have been applied in other fields, if we embrace, embrace both experimental models and um, better designed and um, better quality human studies, uh, the, you know, we're, we're, I'm, we've had a leap forward in the last few years. I'm very optimistic about the next several years, but, um, you know, there's, there's actually very little data supporting a lot of our, our assumptions. And, um, I, I, I'm excited that that's going to, to change clearly. You know, I'm, I'm expecting that a lot of the things that I believe or have found when we understand better will be found not to, to be true. And I'm really looking forward to sort of how that all starts to unfold over the next several years. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you again for joining us for today's event. Uh, thank you to our amazing panelists for your time and for all the insight you've shared. Um, and then also we want to thank our sponsor, Abby, who support um, made this webinar and some of the work that we've done possible. Uh, we will be sending out a recording of today's webinar to everyone who signed up. So watch out for that in your email. And again, thank you for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your day.